can't express in words, well, at least I'll try, and how great it is to be worshiping with all of you this morning. Um, such a beautiful service already. There's so many, I was just mentioning to Tricia, how many children are in this church? I mean, that's awesome. Uh, this, this, and then the bells were amazing. Just, it's so great to be here. Um, some of you might know me, and most of you don't. So for those who don't, um, I am Pastor Josh Walker. I'm an ordained elder in the United Methodist Church. And uh, I serve in extension ministry at Agape Safe Haven, which is a homeless shelter here in town. Uh, but I have pastored churches all around the Front Range. I was the lead pastor at Erie. Uh, actually, that's where Claire came from. So I was there before Pastor Claire. And then uh, I was associate at Long's Peak. And uh, so um, it's kind of nice to, to come back and be able to preach. You know, normally my, my Mondays or my Sundays are left to, uh, to football and other things on, uh, on Sunday where I'm not prepping for, uh, for preaching. So it's kind of nice to get back into the swing of things, so to speak. Uh, I'll start today's message with a line from uh, my late uh, mentor, um, Reverend Chuck Schuster. He used to always say, I'm a better preacher than practicer. <laughs> and when I preach, when I preach, I preach from the Bible. Um, hopefully inspired by God, discerned over the time that I've been uh, called to, to preach. And, and and I'm always wondering, thinking about, and praying about what is it that God is placing on my heart to share with the congregation, to share with the church. And coincidentally enough, it's the same thing that God is trying to tell me as well, right? And I think for the pastors that we have here today can relate to preaching is not just for those we're preaching to, but for those who are actually giving the sermon. Uh, as I prayed and read and looked through the lectionary selection of readings for this Sunday, the one thing that crossed my mind the most, and I don't know if it's because it's the first week of January and we're coming out of the Christmas season and we're starting to get those credit card bills in the mail of all the, all the spending we did, but worry seems to be at kind of the top of the list. And maybe it's because of the credit card bills, maybe it's because of you know, this whole last couple of weeks, we've been trying to find a speaker of the house, and I think Saturday morning they finally did it, and so that certainly has been a little, little uh, uh, worrisome. Um, we're coming up in a couple months of the invasion, uh, one-year anniversary of the invasion of Ukraine, so that certainly strikes some, some anxiety. Maybe it's because last year's stock market was the worst return since 2008, and we're kind of just dealing with that. Um, or maybe it's because, you know, like Tricia was explaining earlier, I've got a daughter who's going to be going to school in the fall, um, and I'm wondering, you know, is she going to get accepted into those schools that she wants to go to and, and all that stuff? I'm not sure what it is, but there is a lot of things on any given day that we all tend to worry about. So, let me start on a lighter note with a joke. A man was seen fleeing down the hall of the hospital just before his operation. A security guard stopped him before he could leave the hospital and asked, what's the matter? The man said, I heard the nurse say it's a very simple operation. Don't worry. I'm sure it will be all right. The security guard says, well, she was just trying to comfort you. What's so frightening about that? And the man said, she wasn't talking to me. She was talking to the doctor. I unfortunately have been struggling with anxiety for the better part of my life. Um, most, if not all, of my worries and anxiety since I was young have been the what-ifs that we conjure up in our minds, the, the doom and gloom thoughts that never come to fruition. You would think a 46-year-old man who's a pastor would have conquered all that worry by now. I mean, all you have to do is look through the Bible and see how many passages there are about telling us not to worry, that God's in control, that everything's going to be okay. Uh, one of my favorites that I wanted to share with you today is Psalm 30, and it's a great one to read at times when you're, you're feeling down, you're worried about something, and it, and it reads, I will extol you, O Lord, for you have drawn me up, and did not lay my foes rejoice over me. O Lord, my God, I cried to you for help, and 
you have healed me. O Lord, you brought up my soul from Shoal, restored me to life from among those gone down to the pit. Sing praises to the Lord, O you, his faithful ones, and give thanks to his holy name. For his anger is but for a moment, his favor is for a lifetime. Weeping may linger for the night, but joy comes with the morning. As for me, I said in my prosperity, I shall never be moved. By your favor, O Lord, you had established me as a strong mountain. You hid your face, and I was dismayed. To you, O Lord, I cried, and to the Lord I made supplication. A prophet is there in my death if I go down to the pit. Will the dust praise you? Will it tell you your faithfulness? Tell of your faithfulness? Hear, O Lord, and be gracious to me. O Lord, be my helper. You have turned my mourning into dancing. You have taken off my sackcloth and clothed me in the joy, so that my soul may praise you and not be silent. O Lord, my God, I will give thanks to you forever. The Bible is peppered with various verses just like this that give us hope, that give us confidence that God is there with us through all of our struggles. And today's scripture reading is a very popular one. From the mouth of Jesus, as as we read, he tells us not to worry. He says, who among you by worrying can add a single moment to your life? That makes sense. And then he continues, stop worrying about tomorrow because tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Yeah. You know, years ago I was listening to a song by this uh, artist named Jason Mraz. And I don't know if anyone knows of this, uh, this artist, but he has a song that's called The Remedy. It's a song that Jason wrote after a good friend of his was diagnosed with cancer. And in the chorus of the song, it says, I, will, I won't worry my life away. And when I heard this song, that chorus of I won't worry my life away became kind of like a mantra. Every time that I would worry, I'd think about, I won't worry my life away. And as soon as worry would infiltrate my head, I would think of that song. And it, it kind of helped, but it, it really was time that cured my worry. I couldn't really think the worry away. So what can I do not to let worry take hold of my life? I'm asking these questions to myself, but maybe you've experienced the same. Maybe you've let worry control your life, your day, your week, your month. If not, then this message isn't for you, and I'm sure Pastor Claire will have another one next week that's better suited, but if you're hearing it today and it does preach to you, let's dig into it. So if we don't want to worry our life away, we have to find the source of our worry. And I'm not talking about the things that we worry about, but really what is the source? I'm talking about the opposite of worry. The antithesis of worry. Worry is the loss of hope and trust, isn't it? If you're full of hope, then there would be no room for worry. When we worry, there is no confidence that things will turn out okay. Worry is void of hope. And in today's scripture reading, Jesus poses a question about whether or not worry adds to our life or not by saying, who among you, by worrying, can add a single moment to your life? And he went on to make clear that what he was calling for instead was for us to trust God. He referred to the birds that do not sow nor reap the fields, but still are fed by God. He pointed to the flowers and the lilies of the field, And said, they don't toil or spin, they're not worried, but they're clothed in beauty anyway. See, Jesus is talking to us who do worry, who do sow and reap in terms of what we do during our daily 
course of, of our day and working and everything else. And Jesus isn't telling us to stop doing those things. We all have to go to work. We all are raising children. We all are taking care of each other. He is simply wanting us to understand that our lives are a lot more important than all of those things that we're doing during the day. More important than what's packed into your calendar for this week. More important than how big your inbox is when you get to work tomorrow morning. More important than what's posted on your social media pages. Jesus connects the call to not worry to the kingdom of God. And he says, instead, desire first and foremost God's kingdom and God's righteousness. And all these things will be given to you as well. He's making an important connection here because God is the ultimate reason for hope. God knows we need things. We need things to survive and maintain our survival. But in the end, good always trumps evil. As members of God's kingdom, we win. All is good. All is restored. Sure, is it still possible to worry? Absolutely, we're human. But it's temporary. Think of the things we worry about on a daily basis. They are temporary. And knowing that we have every reason to be optimistic about God's activity in our lives, that's permanent, even eternal. Think about the things we worry about. A bad, di a bad diagnosis from a doctor, loss of a job, Will my daughter get into the school she wants, or will my wife and I be able to afford it? Those worries, but are those worries temporary? My worries don't go away by reading Scripture. I wish they did, but I'm a sinner like everybody else, not trusting God on a daily basis, right? Or maybe listening to positive music. It's usually time that cures the worry. Enough time that has gone by where that doom and gloom and that what-if scenario in my mind, things just didn't come to fruition the way that I planted them in my head, and all of a sudden I'm like, I'm glad that didn't happen. I'm ready for the next worry. <laughs> Our worries are typically not about the world ending. They're more temporary. And when we focus on the permanent hope of God, we can rest in knowing that everything will be okay. Now, I know what you're thinking. It's not that easy, Josh. And I get it. One commentary uh, I was reading, it put Jesus' words this way, kind of in today's language. It said, since you trust God that all things will ultimately work out for the good, and since you trust that he cares for you even more than he cares for birds and flowers, you therefore should not worry about what you wear or eat or drink. Yeah, that's true. But if it was that simple, I don't think the Bible would have so much scripture in there about trusting God and not worrying, right? It would be a much smaller Bible. So maybe we've missed the point. Maybe the scripture that we read today, maybe Jesus' message to us isn't just about don't worry. Maybe what he's talking about is much deeper. Maybe in order for us to fix our worry or to eliminate the worries, maybe we need to do something else. And he does tell us that in that scripture. It's there, it says, desire God and his righteousness. In others' translations, it says, strive for the kingdom of God and his righteousness. You see, when we desire, when we strive for God, the tendencies of us to worry about the temporal things start to dissipate. None of this is to say we won't therefore have some normal worries. We, we love other people. We love people. We're worried about threats to their well-being. We, we, we cannot be sensitive people without occasionally being concerned of, of what we're doing. We, we can't listen to the news without some uneasiness about a direction that make things seem like there's no hope, but we can be focused enough on the things of God that we're able to relax. Relax about our priorities. 
and rest in the confidence of God. And that is the definition of hope. So how do we desire and strive for God? That's the question, right? That's the point of today's scripture and what seems to be the antidote to worry. Well, I think we can all agree that anything that we do for God is going to carry some risks. If risk wasn't involved in discipleship, then I don't think there'd be a church out there that wasn't having some financial trouble. Everybody would tithe, 10% of everything everyone made would come into the church, and it'd be great, right? If risk wasn't involved in discipleship, then maybe there, there, there'd probably be a waiting lists for mission trips. If risk wasn't part of discipleship, then evangelism and speaking to our loved ones, even strangers, might be something we just do on a regular basis. Maybe striving for God and desiring God first is more important and more in taking, about taking risks than anything else. Maybe doing things that are outside the norm is where the rubber really meets the road on our call to striving for God. Is God telling us to take risks and then the byproduct is eliminating or reducing our worry? I think so. But that's scary, right? Taking risks. But taking risks is how change happens. A risk like an English woman who took a risk when she started writing a book for the first time as a single mother on welfare and she titled it Harry Potter. The kind of risk that a company might take when they're out of money and all 50 employees of this company decide to defer their income for two years to keep the company afloat. And then after 10 years, that company is worth over $3 billion and now is a major streaming music source called Pandora. Instead of waiting for great things to happen by doing the same thing, we have to change. And in order to change, we have to take some risks. We have to get outside of our comfort zones. And what makes risks and getting outside of our comfort zones so dangerous is because we're worried about failure. What if it doesn't work out? I think we can learn a lot from God about taking risks. God has always been taking risks from the beginning of time. The Israelites in the Old Testament waited for this shock and awe of God to come down to destroy their enemies and wipe their problems away. And then finally, when they're told their their Savior is here, they were told that He came in the form of a baby. And then, He was here not to save them from their enemy, but from themselves. And then He was crucified. And finally, when we think about God and we think about the risks that he has taken, what bigger risk is there in giving up your only son to save the world? Did God blow it? Did he mess up? No. He took a risk. Theodore Seuss Geisel, better known as Dr. Seuss, had his first book rejected by 27 different publishers. After Harrison Ford's first small movie role, an executive took him into his office and told him he'd never succeed in the movie business. Steven Spielberg was rejected by USC in the Cinematic Arts Department multiple times. Walt Disney was fired by a newspaper editor because he, quote-unquote, lacked imagination and had no good ideas. Thomas Edison's teacher told him he was too stupid to learn anything. If any of those people had used their failures as an excuse to quit, can you imagine what we would have missed out on? With this so-called failure of the king of the Jews being crucified, turned out it was necessary. Necessary for the redemption of the world. Then without death there is no resurrection without resurrection there is no saved world failure can be embraced as a gift my dad once told me that success is based on experience and experience is based on failure we learn from our failures 
And if we don't risk failure, then we're not getting outside of our comfort zone, and change will not occur. We have to let go of what's comfortable, of where we're at, in order to risk enough to achieve those God-sized dreams. What worries are you allowing to take hold in your life as you try to strive toward God? Is that fear of failure? Is that what's holding you back? Or is it something else? Is it pride? Is it reputation? Is it what people might think? Is it attitude? Is it losing control? It's difficult to let go of stuff, especially when we think that stuff is what's keeping us comfortable. But didn't we just read that our lives are more important than all of that stuff? All of the sowing and reaping and the spinning and the toiling? The process of letting go is it's what feels comfortable and letting that go. It's to be in this space where no change can happen and it's best described as a theory of non-attachment. Let me explain. In theology school, I went to ILIF and I had the unique opportunity to study, study under Reverend Dr. Jane Bernard. Um, she's an expert in spiritual practice, one of my favorite professors. And she had a theory, it's called non-attachment, and I think it's very pertinent for us today in this message. Bernard describes two polarities called attachment and detachment. When one is attached to, to a way of life, or to a person, or to a ministry, a feeling, you fill in the blank, whatever it is that you're attached to, they sense the, the, this gift of passion. There's also, at the same time, this loss of vision, and one can be enmeshed. It's like repelling, if, everyone's had, if anyone's had that experience, when you repel, you have to let go a little bit to go down the cliff. Feelings of fear and holding on will limit your experience. But this doesn't mean that we have to take risks haphazardly. On the other side of that continuum is detachment, where one can have better perspective, right? But they may find themselves isolated and indifferent. We must take risk and be engaged, but not so fearful a change that we never step off the ledge. We need to be in that fluid space, between these two, where we can be both self-reflective about whatever the dream or whatever we're trying to do and making that, but also committed. Non-attachment is a way of living where we find ourselves in the middle of attachment and detachment, that fluid space where we're, we've let go enough to stay engaged. Who do you know? that embody this lifestyle of always being engaged, but never attached. Jesus? Jesus lived that out, right? He lived out this non-attachment world, being in the world, but not of the world. And whatever your obstacles are that you're trying to let go of, it can't be bigger than that reward of striving after God. Does striving toward and desiring God include God-sized goals for you in your life? We see our limitations where God sees our potential. How true is that? We see our limitations where God sees our potential. Any salesperson will tell you that the biggest objections are the ones between the salesman's ears. It seems that sometimes our own worst enemy is ourself. A few weeks ago, I had the opportunity to be a part of your church meeting here where it was voted on to work with the in-between to provide housing for the homeless. I'm sure there were some of you that thought, I don't know, that's a commitment. There's some risk there. And I'm sure there were others who were like, okay, let's accept this. Let's trust in God and let's move forward in striving toward this goal. What a blessing to see this revival of this faith community. What a blessing to have Pastor Claire lead this congregation into the unknown, taking risks and challenging you all 
to seek God first and foremost. I'm excited, and I'm not even a part of the church. What will the heart of Longmont look like in 10 years? I can't wait to see. God expects us all to take risks. God requires our our participation in making those dreams a reality. And God has taken some risks, as we mentioned. Flooding the world and starting over was a risk, but a more of a risk was God picking a man with a drinking problem to build an ark to put two of every animal on that ark while his neighbors looked on. God put us on this world to make disciples for transformation, and we won't reach our God-sized dreams by playing it safe. We have to take risks. Focusing on God and striving after His righteousness requires risk, but during this process, we will find ourselves not worrying our life away. No fabricated what-ifs in our head, no temporary job loss, no negative doctor's report, no short-term money problem stands a chance in taking over when you're focused on taking risks, striving after God. So let go of whatever you're attached to. Take some risks. God has a plan for each one of you. The only question is whether you're willing to do it. So pray for me to do the same. After all, I'm a better preacher than practicer. Amen?